Thank you for joining me for episode 10 of First Drafts That Glow, a flash fiction short story writing project where I kind of just, you know, hammer a story out and then I read it to you. And it is what we would uh, tend to call a first draft. Ooh, which means it's not perfect. It's going to have like weirdness and inconsistencies and it's just going to be a beautiful thing, you know? And I'm just so happy you're you're joining me here for this cuz um you know, this is it it just forces me to write. And this is uh 10 weeks in a row that I've written 10 stories. Some of them have been really good. And others, eh, not so much. This one, I'm not really sure what I was doing with it. It just kind of ran away from me. Like, I had this idea for a story, and I wanted it to be body horror. You know, wait, there's, there's a lot of really great horror out there that is specifically body horror. And as a trans person, um, that stuff really kind of appeals to me. <clears throat> so I tried, and this is what happened. So I'm really sorry. Um, now, as you can tell, I'm wearing a bit of an earpiece here because I'm getting used to this microphone, this wonderfully sexy microphone that a very delightful human that is um, just amazing. I mean, she's pretty great. Um, I got this for my birthday from her. I, I can't remember if I said that last episode or not, but um, I did not think about where it was placed uh, last episode, so here we are. Now, obvious, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously I won't be... It, it, you know, leaning back and reading the way that I uh, used to. I even had to bring the camera up much closer because of how I'm sitting. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, this is all like, you know, experimentation. We're, we're just having fun here. We're, we're having fun. Now, <clears throat> excuse me again. Goodness, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um... Content warning, uh, there is, uh, there is some, like, uh, self-harm that's mentioned, um, there is, uh, uh mention of, uh, despair, um, ID, uh, suicidal ideology or ideation, one is it? Tell me below. Um, it's not super heavy. I kind of go off the rails. Uh, this is pretty much something that, you know, if I, if I spent time developing it, it would be more of like an Alan Moore, uh, Grant Morrison, um, like just batshit crazy, like thing. But I mean, that's why we're here, right? We're we're here to experience my insanity. Looking for my glasses. On my head. I don't. My hair is. My hair and I were having a fight, but who fucking cares, right? You come here because I'm reading entertaining stories that could be a seed for you. <clears throat> could just be a distraction. Um, who knows? Like and subscribe. Uh, comment below. And, um, yeah. Let's get into it. Um, this story is called Implore the Forgetful. And as I've said before, when I write these stories, I name them first. I, I collect some random words and I just kind of, um, from those words what the title's going to be and then that title kind of develops the kind of story that I'm writing and like I said this one just got away from me I 
thought it was going to be one thing and I was I got about 2,000 words in, took a nap, and then it became something else. And normally I don't take a nap in the middle of writing. I just try to punch out like five, 7,000 words um, in one go, which is, you know, pretty intense for the vast majority of writers out there. And I'm not trying to shame or brag or anything. It's just my process. Like anytime I write, concept out or something like that I try to get as much out as possible and with these stories I try to keep them as raw and as fresh um yeah I try to keep them you know pretty nasty. um it helps me develop faster writing techniques uh problem solving when it comes to story writing um you know, because I'm thinking <clears throat> if I ever get a job in a writer's room, I'm going to be, um, you know, I forgot to turn on one of the lights here, but screw it. Um, but, you know, if I ever get a job in a writer's room, one of my main strengths is going to be what is the base idea for today. And I'll be able to knock out like three or four ideas, you know, like quick um yeah i mean they might be trash and they'll obviously need work but i mean what writer rooms are for <laughs> okay anyways writing by committee sometimes it just sucks like how many movies are written by committee that are just like you're just like who the fuck put that in here anyways oh gosh All right, let's get into it because I have stuff to do, and it's pretty late, and I'm kind of tired. Um, I haven't been sleeping really well this week, so. <sighs> do you like that my voice is so much clearer and crisper here for you? <laughs> oh, I'm so full of myself. Uh, anyways. Here we go. You ready? All right. This is Implore the Forgetful, a first draft cyclo story by me, Avon, or Nail Cyclo, depending on how you know me. I don't think I really introduced myself. There you go. All right. Here we go. Looking over his room to make sure everything is in place, the letters written, all the subscriptions canceled, and all perishables food thrown away and in containers outside. Notice for power to be turned off at the end of the week, and the other utilities set to end at the first of the month. All the valuables from the safety deposit box in the container on the kitchen counter, and all savings and money used to buy various crypto. You... Oh my gosh. <clears throat> all the valuables from the safety deposit box in the container on the kitchen counter and all that savings and money used to buy various crypto and in a cold wallet with access information on acid-free paper. Everything was set. Even the obsessively large clothing collection was packed up in traveling closets and packed in large storage bins. Nothing was left. No yard to worry about. That was just stone and cactus in the front and a large empty pool in the back surrounded by a rock garden. Everything was ready. Tay decided to shower one last time. His checklist was done. He felt ready to enter the final phase of this journey. He thought to himself as he went over the entire list again, how wonderful or horrible this might be. In the mirror, he looked over his carefully groomed body to make sure he did not miss anything. Only one shot at this, he mutters. The scars on his upper arms and legs and neat stacks, reminding him of when he thought this was the only way to feel something other than sadness and fear. The chaos of the marks on his chest and the scar left behind when he decided to remove his own testicles. 
He felt it was all to prepare himself for tonight. No more... <clears throat> Excuse me again, goodness, I'm so sorry. No more desperately trying to find peace in a body he hated. He wasn't even sure he was a he, or wanted to be a she. He just knew that whatever the options were in this world, they were all far too constricting. The large scar on his neck was the most recent, the only one that was an actual accident, but the one that brought the visitor to him. He ran his fingers over the raised and darker skin on his neck following the contours. The car accident was one of... <clears throat> The car accident was one of those cinematic things you never believe. Just walking across the street with the rest of the people, when two cars flipped after sliding into each other, crashing right in front of Tay. It crushed three people walking just in front of him, and the metal and glass that spewed out cut Tay in his neck before one of the car doors flew into him, flatly pushing him out of the way. A... Oh, flat, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> this is why we're here, right? Ooh. Um, flatly pushing him out of the way of the third card that could not manage to stop. The money he got from the accident was obscene. The state paid because of the condition of the road, and the two drivers that survived were found to have been on various drugs. The driver, the driver that died was an inconsistent part of it all. In court, Tay remembered the pain through the painkiller haze he was still in, that the dead driver was in a state of decay already. It was all over the news after it leaked from the morgue. Tay remembered being told over and over by his legal counsel that he needed to just put that out of his mind. Looking at his phone as the alarm goes off, Tay brought back is brought back to the now. His diving into the and to that period felt more real each time he thought about it. Perhaps it was part of the arrangement, he mused to himself. He sprayed himself down with rose oil and rubbed salt into his hair. Taking the plain silver rod in his right hand, he goes into the basement. The smell was the kind that makes you think of dying and drying flowers. The sweetness and sickly hint of decay, enticing and fearfully relaxing. He grabs the fireplace matches from the last step. The cold rod held under his right armpit. He slowly makes his way around, lighting all of the tall candles neatly placed on small shelves. In the center of the room, the visitor. It looked to be an uncomfortable mix of various body parts of mismatched sizes. The head being the most confusing thing as it seemed to change slowly like melting wax. No seams, scars, or slowness of movement. The bed it rested on was a California king. It filled the entire mattress, and it still looked slightly elegant. After Tay lit the last candle along the wall, the visitor looks up and smiles with lips that slowly changes that slowly change as it talks. Are you ready then? Tay nods. He hands the silver rod over and sits in a lotus position next to the head of the bed. He bows slightly. I've set everything up like you suggested to keep things orderly. The cold wallet for the currency will be of great service. The visitor nods. I'm sure that will make sense to me shortly. Throwing its head back, the creature opens its mouth and drops the silver rod. It moves its head like a cat about to serve up a furball before looking at Tay and grinning with a new facial arrangement. Tay had gotten used to this, but it was still unsettling. How long until we... Holding one of its arms up, the heavy-looking muscles and dark skin ending in a pale, thin hand. You must wait until it happens. Then you do as I did, and we will be on our way. I suggest you sleep if you can. The grimace in Tay's face was over the top. I have not eaten in two days as per your request. My body is in a mode that prevents me relaxing right now. 
I'm sorry. I will try to sit and wait. The sound was likely intended to be a laugh or a chuckle. It sounded as if an elephant and a dog were arguing. Nothing to apologize for. Each human is unlike the other. I have grown used to this. Tay nods. Could we talk? No. The final flavor of the reply caused Tay to urinate a small bit. He clenched in ways he was unaware that he could. Even the fierceness of his jaws tightening caused a subtle crack sound. He felt concerned for the first time. The visitor lays down and appears to sleep. One of the eyes always open. The other would be closed as the shifting body and features shape. The dream quality of the visitor made it hard to focus on any one part for longer than a moment before having to look at something else. Tay wondered if there would be a final form the visitor would take one day. Hours, perhaps days later, Tay comes out of a delirium. The hunger, pains, and thirst he felt overcoming his ability to remain to remain focused. His eyes felt like stones and his tongue was wood. He was unable to move without effort and his arm shook when he picked up the ha- picked up his hand to reach for the silver rod that was now on the bed. The visitor was gone. Just the rod left, a slight shift in the texture of it. It was almost impossible for him to pick up. He needed both of his hands to lift it. Tilting his head back hurt. He felt dizzy and questioned if he was actually awake. If he might have died already, and if this is a fever dream in the throes of death. Must. Speaking hurt and stopped him as he slowly raised the rod above his open mouth. The end of the rod brushing his chin, clanking on its teeth breaking one or more short sh- <laughs> the end of the rod brushing his chin clanking on his teeth breaking one or more showering fragments into his throat he coughs a few times before dropping the rod into his mouth it was not as smooth as when the visitor did it it hit his tongue and it hurt more teeth cracked as he heard <laughs> As he heard two, as he heard two crunching sounds, like what? What the fuck am I writing there? It hit his tongue. It hurt. More teeth cracked as he heard crunching sounds. He started to feel the harshness of the fragments in his throat. Then, without really feeling it, the rod slips down into his throat. Tay eventually wakes up in the same spot. The room is cold. The candle's gone. He does notice that he can see perfectly. Upstairs, he finds a hallway mirror and is amazed. The body and face were not quite his. Not entirely. There were changes. Shapes and curves that were unlike the body of the boy that once was. Perfectly hairless. Nice-shaped penis falling from a clitoral hood and hugged by a labia at the base, leading to a vagina that he explored. He then noticed his chest was not developed with breasts, but were muscular and had a softness. His new face was more feminine than he would have expected. All the facial hair was gone. The nose had a small upturn at the tip. The eyes seemed to be more open, and the forehead had a new hairline. Even the ears had a new shape. Smiling, Tay started thinking of a new name and decided the terms they them were going to have to work for now. A whisper inside their mind had them shower and dress in the clothing set aside. It all fit perfectly. The visitor knew what would happen, Tay thinks. Another whisper and they decided that the name Andy was the right one. It fit the clothing slim-fitting pants and loose button shirt with no sleeves and a smart jacket. The hair seemed to be just in a perfect state, no fussing required. Looking over the house, Andy decided to take the cold wallet and leave. A week later, Andy was living their best life. 
The influence of the visitor was present for Andy every day, giving them a confidence and charisma previously unknown. It was time to enjoy feeling confident in the world. Their new voice and body was not easy to get used to. Once they found a hotel they could stay in for a few months, they didn't leave the room, exploring the new body. Andy felt like they were in the bathtub at the age of nine, discovering a new sensation. It was also like when they discovered internet porn and tried to sneak time on the internet without the parents knowing they were furiously downloading all the pictures they could over the old dial-up connection. Andy thought about the zip drive they kept through adulthood as a memento of that time. Whispers in their head got louder the past few days. Andy wasn't settled by it, but not angry or really frustrated. They knew one of the they knew one of the conditions, and it was time to start. The nightclub took up half the floor of a skyscraper. It was a glorious space with a long wall overlooking the city from 30 floors up. The red, purple, and pink lights with brighter accents felt energizing. Andy had never been to a club before. Not like this. Just dive bars with a dance floor. A nightclub with a few hundred people, and it didn't feel crowded. And it was amazing. The music pouring from every corner in space... Nowhere was safe from the drone of bass and echoing lyrics. Many of the men and women were winking or giving big smiles as Andy walked through the crowd to the bar that was slightly off-center of everything in an egg shape. The bartender served Andy their drink, and after a short performance to mix it up, the whispers told Andy to wait. The right person was not seen yet. It took hours and many drinks, some drinks were offered as the whispers told Andy not to accept them. After a few hours without even thinking, Andy saw a girl and approached her. How is your night? Flagging the bartender down, what would you like to drink? A small smile showed up on her face, rum and coke. Her blush overtook her face. Two Jaeger bombs and two rum and cokes, please. Andy kept keeping their eyes on the girl as he ordered. The bartender tapped Andy's smartwatch with his own. Thanks, my guy. Checking his watch, he tips the bartender a few extra bucks, causing the bartender to clang a bell. My name is Andy, they say as they move one of each of the drinks to the girl. What is your name? I'm Ash. She slams the Jaeger bomb without a blink. Wow, that was intense. Andy slams her Jaeger bomb, caught off guard by its sweetness. Yep, that's the first one of those I ever had. You're kidding. That's my second favorite drink next to spiced rum. She softly sips a cocktail. Well, I tend to drink things that are not as sweet. I think that may change. Sipping their cocktail and pulling an ice cube to diffuse the syrup texture still in their mouth. Ash looks up. <laughs> oh my gosh. Ash looks Andy up and down. Being a slight bit shorter, her looking up trying to study Andy's face and the colored light got her leaning in. Andy notices squinting with a smile. Ash sits on the stool next to her, sips her drink again. Can I ask you a question? Please do. Do you have a dick or a pussy? Andy looks over Ash slowly. Why do you ask? Oh, um, I was just curious. You are very pretty. I was trying to figure out if you like being called pretty or handsome. Finishing your drink with a final large swig. I am, a, uh, I'm horny. <laughs> she takes a deep breath and exhales. Well, <laughs> goodness, that's more forward than I intend to be. That's embarrassing. Andy flags the bartender for another round. What arrangement would be the most appealing to you? It's all nice for me, really. Tonight I want to be topped and not worry about having to drive. You are forward, setting the drinks before her as they talk. 
I get it. I came out for some people time and alleviate some of my loneliness. I've never been good with flirting. It never occurred to me to just tell someone I was horny. Ash slams a second Jaeger bomb. Okay, no more of those. She sips the cocktail. My bestie would be mortified I just said that to you, to a stranger. She has been trying to get me to be a little more patient with my libido. My last relationship ended with her stealing my Xbox. Well, to answer your question, I'm endowed with a unique arrangement. And I do prefer to drive. A sly wink as they slam the Jaeger bomb. It's just been a long time since I've been out and talking to people. I'm a little out of practice. Ash raises her cocktail to Andy. To practice. Hours later in many awkward conversations, motivated by drinking and adrenaline, Ash gets out of the bed, grabbing her purse. In the bathroom, she begins to assemble the odd gun she was given, going over the instructions of how to put it together properly. This started the night before the accident that Andy was involved with. Ash and her girlfriend were watching one of the generic TV shows that show up every other month with 10 episodes to consume over the weekend. Something seemed to start to bother her girlfriend out of the blue. Ash was afraid it was something she had done. Then Ash was hit in the face with a fist and blacked out. When she woke up, she was in the hospital. Her friend had come home to see the living room turned upside down and Ash on the floor bleeding slightly from her head. When she woke up, she was very confused as to what happened, asking her friend, what the fuck is going on? Timmy jumps to Ash's side. Oh, gods, I'm so happy you're awake. What happened? The echoes the light produced made it hard for her to open her eyes fully. Why does my head hurt so much? Your crazy, your crazy girlfriend must have hit you. She took your Xbox, some of the tablets, and I couldn't find your smartwatch or your earbuds. What? But why, why would she do that? Ash tries to sit up. We were watching that new show with the girls all gothic and cheesy. It, it was such a nice day. No idea, but the police are here. They told me to get them when you came around. Are you okay to talk to them? I can make them wait. No, it, it's okay. This just doesn't make sense. The police were kind and patient. They were glancing at Demi as they asked questions, and she would remind them she was a lawyer every few, every few moments. It took them nearly 20 minutes before they seemed to be satisfied of the timeline of events before they reported that the car registered under Ash's name was in an accident and the driver was dead. They suspected it had been stolen, but now believed it was Ash's girlfriend. The body had been crushed, making an ID difficult. The following days were hard. Finding out that some people died and that her car was the cause of more injury, it was so confusing and frustrating. Therapy did little to help. Short flirtation with some hard drugs did not help either. Just got her in the hospital again for an overdose. After almost a year, she was more balanced, but not according to her bestie, Demi. Ash, you need to stop bringing these randos over to fuck. <clears throat> the last one pissed all over the bathroom like it was a litter box. I nearly pissed myself cleaning it up before I could pee. Yeah, okay. Her face never leaving the switch screen. Are you even playing or watching anything on that? Demi grabs the candy color device. Oh my god, Ash. Is this the game you've been working on? Yeah. Her voice just above a whisper. I recognize your art style, but what is this game? Demi starts to move the character around the screen. She walks it through a house with all the items packed up like they are moving. The character looking like he is scarred up and wearing a loincloth. Anachronistic, since it looked like a modern house around him. What is this, a game or one of those walking simula simulators with a story to find? Ash shrugs. Not sure. 
I've been having nightmares and random dreams. This guy keeps showing up in his obsessive arrangement of items. It just keeps going over and over in my head. Babe, we need to go out. We need to go out somewhere that is not one of those dingy places you find in these low-key... You find these low-key incels and chads. Handing the switch back, Demi tries her best to get Ash to look at her. I just want you to be happy. I want... I want to help you as much as I can. I love you. You are the best friend anyone could ever have. Ash nods and smiles. Okay. When did you want to go out? Tonight, Demi exclaims. It took Ash a few hours to get Demi drunk. Um, <laughs> it took Ash a few hours to get Demi too drunk to hang. She clocked out of the night, making Ash promise to come home alone and not hook up with the first cute human that smiled. Ash promised. After another hour at the club, she decided it was time to go home before she did invite one of those tight pants wearing girls over. Outside, she heard a gruff voice call out, Ash, may we speak to you? The two men were very pretty. One of them had that classic film star face of the 30s, and the other looked like he belonged to a boy band. She assumed they were gay and clocked her. Yeah, why not? Oh no, I do not want you to think we are wanting anything but your help. Or, but, oh no, I do not want you to think we are wanting anything but to help you. The film star said. The boy band did not talk. Okay, then. What is up, then? Ash took note of her inability to focus on her words properly, and she tried again. Okay. What's the deal, then, okay? The film star smiled. We know what happened to you and about the dreams you are having. We want to help you in the dreams and to stop others from being hurt. Ash looks at both of them like a tennis match. Left. Then right, then left, then right. Each time her head bobs slightly. What are you talking about? Perhaps if you come with us, we can sober you up and explain ourselves. The star holds his hand, palm out. Ash feels like she knows them. And she agrees. The house was very strange to Ash. She thought they were entering a brownstone, and the inside... Kind of looked like a large studio. There were marble-looking panels on the walls, and the tables were real solid wood, not something from a flat pack. They lead her to a room with the fountain as a feature, where most people would expect a TV. She felt disoriented because this couldn't be in a brownstone. Is this a fucking TARDIS? The star laughs and the boy band smiles as he leaves the room. No, the star says, we are in our home. You are most welcome to relax and be free of any pressure from the outside world. You are our most honored guest. Okay, but that is some serial killer shit right there. Ash pulls out her phone. Sorry, phones get no sing signal in here. If you like, I can take you back outside if you wish to make a call or to leave, he says. Winking one eye shut, Ash tries her best to focus on the guy. Okay, I suppose I can chill. Just, if you want to fuck, I'll need to use the bathroom first. Kneeling before her, Star holds up a platter with a few bottles of sparkling water and various sodas, all sealed. Nothing of the sort. Please. If you are thirsty, take any of these and find comfort on the sofa, or I can arrange some of those pillows for you. Ash takes the soda, cracking it open. Okay, my dude. You're talking really weird. I am sorry. It really has been a long time since either of us have been allowed to leave or to speak to anyone, let alone one like yourself. Standing, he motions to the sofa and the mound of pillows. Please, relax while we collect a few things. 
Ash looks over the room again, feeling like there is something familiar about the vibe. Hey, this sort of looks like that uh, movie, the original uh, Clash of the Titans, with how all this shit is set up. Sitting on one of the massive pillows, she nearly is enveloped by it. This place is crazy. Her eyes start to clear and focus on the fountain. The details show a woman with a flat chest, hair piled up, men and women kneeling at her feet. Behind the main figure is a disc that's filled with symbols and a suggestion of a halo just above her head. Hey, who or what is that? Star and boy band both come back. Boy band carrying a box and star now in a toga-like robe. He looks at the fountain. Once, women like yourself were thought of as divine. They had a connection to the realms of both human and the gods. Narrowing her eyes, what do you mean, women like me? She air quotes, still holding the soda can. Women born with a body of a man and the soul of a woman. Ash laughs. Okay, this is how you hit on trans girls. You need to update your game, buddy. I'm sorry. Like I said, we, we do not go out to venture out much, and we're still getting used to the fact that the world tried to erase the existence of people like yourself. Please forgive if we offend. English is new to us as well. What are you talking about? You're... Acting like you haven't been around the past 20 years or something. We literally haven't. Star and boy band take cushions next to Ash. We literally only were allowed to enter the modern world the night of your girlfriend's death. A few things sober a girl up more than fear. Ash felt the need to run suddenly and sat up. Star held his hands. Please. I know how this may sound to you. The last time we spoke to a human, we did not do so well, and the crusades happened. This is crazy. I'm leaving. Boy Band opens the box he is holding. Inside, Ash sees a metal object that looked like a gun in a few parts, but it was made up of vines that appeared hollow like an object in one of her games without the texture map covering it. Star puts his hand on her shoulders. This is the same weapon used by some of the people in mythology that you might have read. It changes shape to conform to the world as it evolves. I remember when this was just an odd-shaped blob to mimic a stone. The version of it you may know is the sword that Perseus used in his story. Ash feels relaxed by the smooth voice of Star. She reaches slowly into the box, touching the contours of the object. A slight static charge, and each place she touches begins glowing slightly. Am I dreaming? No, but you must listen because you do have a decision to make. What? We want you to kill something that should not be in your world. Ash pulls back her hand. What the fuck? Star turns Ash to face him. I'm sorry for how awkward and clumsy we are. If, if we ha only had more time, we would have found you when you were younger and trained you like we used to in the old world. These days, the rules are just not the same. You humans have pushed us to the darker corners. He looks to the boy band. He looks to boy band nodding. Boyband leaves the box on the cushion, leaving the room. This is the hardest part of all of this. Killing anything is hard. But what we want you to kill, just, it's not human. They stopped being human the day of the accident. How am I involved in all of this? Your dead partner. She was one of us. When we found them, Tried to kill. <laughs> Sorry. When we found them, they tried to kill the body 
but your partner's will was stronger than they expected. The body died, but the mind still fought. It then found another and found a way to reinforce itself within another mind and body. Okay, this isn't real. You're just trying to convince me to do some insane sex tape or whatever. I need to leave. Standing up, Ash starts to walk in the direction she remembers the door being. Please look over here, Star says. Turning around, Ash sees the wall behind the pillows fade away to a cosmic landscape. In the distance, a mountain surrounded by thick clouds hiding the base. The pillows then fade. Star holding the box walks slowly to Ash as the rest of the room fades. The floor vanishes. The mountain rushes forward as the tip of it gets larger. Buildings of many eras decorate, decorating the top of the mountain. As it comes, comes closer, Ash thinks it will smash her face as it moves to bring her into a large new space. The floor takes on a solid look again. And the space where the pillows were is not taken is now it says not <laughs> is now taken up with a long table with 13 chairs in the center a much larger chair after another moment the center chair fills with a generic masculine figure and the other chairs with other bodies with faces covered by veils the man motions and star approaches my lord, bowing the star motions to Ash. The man looks over Ash and nods. Holding up his right hand, it begins to glow. Star opens the container, and the man's hand motions to it. A bolt slowly, a boat, a <laughs> that's why we're here. A bolt of slow energy arcs from the hand to the box and Star closes it as soon as the tail of the light ends. The man smiles, nodding to Ash. The room then goes dark, and then looks as it did before. What the actual fuck was that? Ash plops down, throwing an unfinished can of soda at the wall behind the pillows. That was Jupiter, to be simple about it. He always hated that name, but humans called him that. He likes being called... Oh. Oh? Yeah, like O-H. He claims it was the first word used by humans. I have a running bet with my brother that he will slip in a few million or so and admit it was just a sound he likes. Okay, this is stupid. Am I in some shitty comic book? Please, this is serious. In the past, we trained those such as you to fight monsters from childhood. This entity is vile and will be killing many people if we do not stop it before it gains momentum. <sighs> Alright, fine. What do I have to do? That was weeks ago. Ash was now in the bathroom putting the weapon together. Knowing that the person, person she just had sex with was not fully human, she was told to find any way to get the creature to let its guard down long enough to assemble the device so it could be used to kill it. Ash was sad. They did seem nice, if not oddly perfect. That had to be a red flag. Nobody's perfect, she says to herself. The assembled gun fits in her hand like she designed it herself. The hollow frame of it began filling up with various metallic colors. It looked like it was something an anime fan would wish into being after watching a high fantasy show and a cowboy cheese fest. Ash loved it. The door made no sound as she opened it. The body still passed out on the bed, face down, turned towards the... Uh, turned, <laughs> turned in the other direction. This is why we're here. Ash Lee levels the gun, pointing at the body, inhales, and pulls the trigger. Just as she pulls the trigger, Andy jumps from the bed, sticking to the ceiling like a spider. Ash falters for a moment. Something left her when she shot. The energy and awareness she felt was diminished somehow. Firing, firing again, Andy leaps down, standing in front of Ash. Who are you? Andy says as... <laughs> 
Andy says as they backhand Ash, dropping her to the floor. Blackness flashes pain. Ash takes a second too long to gather herself, and Andy kicks the gun out of her hands. I said, who are you? Andy's voice and face begin to darken and twist. I'm Ash, she says, and Andy grabs her throat, tossing her with little effort across the room. What is that gun? Is it the divine device? Did they send you? Did you discover you were one of the chosen? Andy jumps from the bathroom door to the other side of the room next to Ash. Did they know I would see your kind out, seek your kind out for food? Fuck you, Ash says, planting her shoulder into Andy's groin, then rolling to the side to reclaim the gun. The next two shots miss Andy as he moves like a glitching NPC. Another shot shatters the window of the hotel room, followed by a rush of cold air. Andy looks to the night sky and screams, No! The room fills with light, and Star and Boy Band show up. Andy screams again, and Ash fires right at their head. Pulling the trigger was just pulling the trigger was just bolts before. Connecting the shot, the bolt turned into a sm similar rope of energy as she had seen before. She could not drop the gun. She felt her strength leaving her body. Andy looking to her as the face started to dissolve, yelling, You sacrificed yourself for what? I'll just be finding my way back, you pathetic. Their body vanishes. Star and Boy Band walk over to Ash. Boy Band collects the pieces of the gun, placing them back into the box. Star takes Ash's hand. Are you ready? Ash looks down at her body. Wait. You didn't say I was going to die. I'm sorry. We're not allowed to say some things. Please, come with me. The Oracle wishes to meet you. Well, fuck. I still haven't beaten Skyrim. Well. That was a train wreck of a story. But I am really thrilled with how it turned out ultimately. I, I, um... There, there were a few ideas that I was playing with. Um, definitely thinking I might come back to this just to flesh it out and to make it seem less chaotic. Um, and I really wanted the um, star and boy band to sound completely like awkward and insane. And I think I did a good job. I think I did a good job. Um, yeah, I, I really... I think you can tell that I was trying to go for body horror and then it just became some kind of comic booky like thing. But, you know, that happens when you write sometimes. Um, it wasn't a story. It wasn't Andy's story. It was Ash's story. And I didn't know that until a few thousand words in, and that happens sometimes. That's why it's a first drafts that glow show instead of a perfectly formatted and edited and written story. Because do you, do you know how difficult that would be to do every week? I wouldn't be able to do anything else. Like, I don't know about you, but I like sleeping and... I, I haven't been doing it a lot lately, but I like playing video games too. And if I was trying to write a fully fleshed out short story every week, oh my god, the burnout would be incredible. So, doing this this way, maybe one day. One day. But uh, like and subscribe below. Tell me what you thought. Um, you know, uh, I just really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy exploring ideas and concepts and writing styles that are completely out of my wheelhouse. Um, I 
know I promised horror stories all month and this isn't exactly a horror story. It's more just like a comic booky kind of like, oh shit, what the fuck is going on? This is dumb kind of thing. You know, it's kind of, it's, it makes me think of the kind of story that you would have seen on Sci-Fi Channel in the 90s. You know what I'm saying? For those of you who are old enough to remember those movies, like, you can look them up. They're, some of them were beautifully horrible. Or um, one of the uh, Full Moon productions. I think you can see a lot of those for free online. But, um, just terrible films. Um, but also gloriously great, you know, because just crazy concepts that just kind of come out of left field and I have such a storehouse of, of Greek uh, Roman mythology philosophy gods and goddesses and stuff like that like that was my absolute favorite thing when I was a kid like anytime we had a thing to do a diorama or write a story I would find an excuse to involve Greek or Roman gods and um, I grew up around the Bible Belt a lot and a lot of conservative Christians they did not really go for that I remember I did this diorama and it was like really detailed and it had centaurs and everything but I got an honorable mention should have gotten fucking first place I want to thank you again for joining me for First Drafts at Glow. That was Implore the Forgetful, episode 10. Like and subscribe. Please don't forget to check out my uh, show notes. Um, I still um, am trying to show some support for my uh, online buddy, Pharaonox. They are um, they're just a great human. Check out their stuff. They make some, some great little... Uh, Objet d'Ar. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know what I'm saying. They make some great stuff. Um, I don't feel like I would describe it adequately. So just go check out the links below. Also, you can visit me at ko-fi.com slash nails at glow. That's ko-fi.com slash nails at glow. You can also visit me on Twitter, First Drafts Glow. Or you can visit my website, Nails That Glow. And I even have a personal Twitter account on uh, Twitter. Listen to me, I can't even talk right. Um, and that, of course, is Nails That Glow. Are you seeing a theme? I really hope you are, because I am Nails That Glow. Even though my nails aren't fully painted today, I just didn't have time before recording. But, um... Yeah, I, again, just thank you ever so much for joining me for for this project, for uh, liking, subscribing, for sharing. You know, tell your friends that this really cute human um, um, reads these, like, fantastical, batshit crazy often cheesy and terrible stories but they're they're always in earnest well i you know i honestly don't fucking know what i'm saying now <laughs> and i i really hope you enjoyed the sound upgrade you know um i i don't want to mention anybody's name without getting explicit explicit permission but she's she's just super wonderful and i super am grateful for this very thoughtful gift and um yeah just you know give your girl a holler tell me what's going on find me on one of those many sources you know my website i keep a daily nightly blog about my uh transition um so you know want to know more about me that's really the way to do it um my twitter is just kind of chaotic so but um yeah anyways once again i want to thank you so so much for joining me it, this has been so wonderful and great and you know i'm not planning on stopping anytime soon and i know i meant 
was meant to start my uh, second podcast, Abstractions at Glow, for my second show. Um, I just didn't get time to do that, so I'm going to try next week. So thanks again. I love you ever so much. And uh, 